Okay, good morning. Um, welcome back on Monday. Seems like it's less and less of a turnout. What else is new? This is the way the semester is going to go. Um, but we will continue on in the process. We actually reached kind of a milestone day today in that we're switching from Photoshop into InDesign. Uh, and like I was telling the contingent in the back, um, things start to move rather quickly from here on out. So we'll be spending a couple weeks on InDesign, then we'll move into Illustrator, and we'll spend a couple weeks on Illustrator, then we'll move into AutoCAD and spend a couple weeks on AutoCAD, then we'll start combining things together, uh, and then all of a sudden the semester will be over. So yeah, it goes by pretty fast, um, but that's, that's kind of the nature of it, okay? So a couple things. One, I'm not going to be here for the next two classes. That doesn't mean that you don't get to be here. Uh, I have a substitute. Um, she has taught this class in the fall semester, the other section of it. She'll be here um, to, to walk you through some InDesign stuff. She's more than competent to, to be able to teach you guys uh, anything she says goes. Uh, you guys have had substitutes before, so I, I'm sure I don't have to give you the substitute lecture. Uh, it is worth showing up. Don't sh if, if you don't show up, I'll know about it. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully. You'll have to tell me. <laughs> um, so uh, you, you will have two exercises. I will make sure that they're posted online. I forget whether I've already posted them or whether I will be posting them. So you'll do exercise 112 and 113 um, while I'm gone. And then you'll come back and, and we'll deal with uh, 114 and kind of wrap up with, with things. Um, so that's kind of the trajectory of where things are going. Um, I also have grade sheets for you. Um, I did not make it through everybody's uh, assignment 101s yet. So what I did in order to make it fair for everybody is I just took the assignments off when I printed the grade sheets. So next time when I get back, you'll get the grade sheets that have the assignment 101s with the comments on them. Uh, but at least this will give you uh, a catch up on where you are on the exercises and where you are on the comments so you can see how you're doing. Um, and we'll walk through that uh, in a little bit. I'm still not used to having 34 of you. It takes me longer to grade than than it used to. So I'm working on it. Um, but I will have those for you as well. So today we're going to talk about graphic design one. Um, and it, I use this kind of as an introduction to graphic design. Um, why are we here? Why are we doing it? What Everything that I say about this will snowball and um, feed right into your architectural design skills. Um, so just because we're talking graphic design today doesn't mean that everything I talk about doesn't directly apply um, to architectural design or home design or library design or whatever it is that your museum, whatever class you're in right now, uh, and whatever you're designing, this stuff still applies. So what is the primary function of design to begin with? Basically, the function of, design, of the design is to communicate some kind of a message through a juxtaposition of words and pictures. This is graphically, right? If we were talking about the function of architectural design, it would be very similar, right? It would be the, the communication of future spaces to the people who might inhabit them. Okay, that's what we're doing. We're trying to communicate that. It's the visual synthesis of thought. Right? So you think up something and you have to find a way to explain it to somebody else. So what, what might be some design objectives? If I made you come up with this list, you could probably come up with this or very close to it. You might have some things to add to it. Uh, but generally in the graphic realm, it would be some kind of a, a guide to persuade you to do something, to encourage you to do something. Right? It may be just a plain communication of information. Right? It might be trying to motivate you, educate you. Right? inspire a dialogue, you get this, right? We could come up with this list, okay? And on and off, I'm going to show you a bunch of uh, portfolio type examples. The final project in this course is a portfolio of your work. Um, so whenever possible, I try to show you portfolios so that you kind of have this going in the back of your mind that it might be something worth thinking about. Um, so there'll be, there'll be intermixed pieces of portfolio um, that I think are very well done that can help um, you down the road. The other thing is the assignment for this section, for the InDesign section, which you don't have yet, you'll get it next class, uh, is going to be to create a poster. So I'll try to put a bunch of posters up there so you can see what posters look like as well. So when we go through and try to establish a function uh, of the design, we have to think about what is the primary purpose? Why are we doing what we're doing? What are we trying to, to show, right? If it's a lecture series poster, which is what you're gonna be doing, what would the, the primary function of a lecture series poster be? Thoughts? Display 
Okay? Dates. When are the lectures going to show up? Right? What else? Why else would you have a poster about the lecture series? Where? What? Where? 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 Where do you show up? That would be good information. What else? Content. Content. Okay, a little summary of who's going to lecture, something like that. How about the basic purpose of getting you to go to the lecture series? Right? That's a good, that's a good reason to have the poster. Right? That you've, anybody notice that there is a lecture series poster on the door when you walk in? Right? There's a reason it's there. It's trying to get you to go. Right? We spend a lot of time creating these. We, I didn't have any say in it. <laughs> um, faculty at large, students at large, spend a lot of time putting these lecture series together, getting people to come talk. It's really worth going to see them. Right? They can be very inspiring. So, uh, what is your primary objective? Who is your audience? Right? If we're talking about the lecture series poster, your primary aud audience is you, the students, trying to get you to go to the lecture. Right? What's your desired reaction? Oh yeah, that looks interesting. I'll go. Right? That's what we're looking for. So what is the fundamental role of a designer? It's the designer's responsibility to create strong communicative experiences that support the function of the design okay, on behalf of the client, the person you're designing it for, and for the viewer, the person who's actually interacting with it. Sometimes the client and the viewer are the same person, sometimes they're not. And you have to be aware if they are the same person or if they're not. So what are some designer skills? And again, this is a list that is by no way comprehensive. And if we sat down and tried to come up with this list, you would come up with a lot of these and many more. right? But it's your job as a designer to analyze, to perceive what's going on, to find a way to communicate what's going on, to do research right, about a particular subject. Right? You want to solve problems. You want to visualize. right? You get the idea. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about inspiration, uh, and I think this is something that's really critical, uh, and it should be a very intuitive, natural thing for you, right? But inspiration just basically means being aware of your surroundings, right? When you're walking around and you see something that looks interesting, you look at it, you analyze it, you become excited about it. We're all in a very unique position as people interested in design to go around the world being amazed by things, right? It's really fun. So you go around and you, you get something in the mail and it's really well packaged. You say, wow, that was really well packaged. Like, I'm excited about that. Right? You might get something that's in the mail and it has a terrible box. And you're like, ew, this is really ugly. Right? It's our job as designers to judge that kind of thing and to think about that kind of thing. So what inspires you? If you're aware, you observe, you're open-minded, you're going to become inspired by a variety of things. Right? It's found and transformed in tangible objects, so it's, it's, it's based on tangible objects. The other thing that's really fun is that it's completely different and subjective for everybody. Okay? We could all go on a field trip to San Francisco right now, and every single one of us, if we went to the same place, let's say we went on a field trip and went to the Exploratorium. Okay? On the way to the Exploratorium, uh, maybe we rode BART or maybe we drove our car or whatever, we would have entirely different experiences and different reactions to it. Maybe somebody would be inspired by some billboard that was along the way. Maybe somebody would be inspired by the shape of the BART train chair. Right? I don't know. That's not particularly something that's inspiring to me, but it might be to you. So you want to think about right, what's inspiring to you and the fact that it's different for every person. And that's normal, and it should be. Okay? It shouldn't require any extra effort to be inspired, right? You're a designer. You have to love this. If this is what you're, if this is, this is the field that you want to be in, whether it's graphic or whether it's architectural design or whether it's product design, right? It shouldn't be a chore. You should love this, right? And if you don't, you might want to consider being a different major, <laughs> okay? It comes from a desire to create or communicate. If you like building things, if you like making things, if you like drawing things, this is easy, okay? If you are inspired by drawing your own stuff, do your own thing, right? If you're inspired by photography and you go out and photograph things, that's great. Whatever it is that's inspiring to you, you should continue to do it, right? The other thing is when you find all this inspiration, you need to find a way to collect it because there comes time when you're sitting working on some project and you need, oh man, I need some inspiration. If you have a file that you look through, it can give you great inspiration. Anybody ever heard of the app on their, their phones or the iPad called House? H-O-U-Z-Z, -Z, maybe a few of you. Uh, if you haven't, if you like architecture, it's really cool, right? It's more of an interior thing than an exterior thing. Basically, it's an application that shows you a bunch of pictures and lets you say, I like this picture, I don't like this picture, right? And there are a bunch of pictures of architecture, 
okay? It's really fun. You just flip through. It's like flipping through a magazine, only you don't have any of the ads or any of the text. You just flip through the pictures, right? Um, this is the same kind of thing, right? How do you collect this stuff that's exciting to you, right? You can put it in uh, your sketchbook, right? Sketchbook shouldn't be something that's precious, right? <laughs> Tape stuff in, tear stuff out. That's part of having a sketchbook, right? Write notes, make drawings, right? You all carry your phones now, take pictures, right? All that's great. And that's a way of collecting this inspiration, right? And you might be inspired by something like this, you know? The fact that the leaf is a pair of lips, but it's also a leaf, right? It's kind of cool. And so you think about that kind of stuff. Maybe you're inspired by it. Maybe not, right? So how do you nourish this inspiration, right? Carry your sketchbook with you, because if you don't carry it with you, you're never going to use it, right? That's always a good thing. You have a camera in your phone. It's really, uh, really easy to pull it out, uh, take pictures. Become immersed in design. Commit to discovering and collecting these inspirational factors. Create a dialogue with fellow designers. You guys are all in school. It makes life really easy for you to have some kind of, a, you're all in the same boat right now, right? You're all interested in design. You could talk to each other about design. It's easy, okay? When you get into the outside world, sometimes it's harder to do that because you're not surrounded by as many people who care about design as you do. Right? The nice thing for me is I come back and I teach you. So at least two days out of the week, I get to be inspired by you guys. Right? And that's something I look forward to. And I should. So be aware of that. You're in a good environment for that. Right? Sometimes you feel like you're stuck. You don't have any inspiration. You're just blah. Right? What happens? What should you do? Go out, take a walk. That always helps. Right? Maybe you listen to music. Maybe you get inspired by music. Right? Interesting, interesting thing about music, everybody has a very personal taste in music and everybody has a very personal um, strategy for how their music can improve or detract from their work. Um, one of the great inventions for studio life was the fact that we all have iPods and headphones and stuff now, right? Because it used to be that everybody in a studio would fight over who had control of the boombox, right? And I know this sounds so old, right? I was in studio before iPods existed, so I experienced this, okay? You would all fight over it, right? And then you'd be in studio and somebody would be playing Enya and you'd be like, oh, I can't design to this. It's horrible, right? Sorry if anybody likes Enya, but not me, right? Anyway, so different people have different tastes and it becomes very sort of personal. And then you end up with weird tangents, right? So I wrote my entire master's thesis listening to the soundtracks of the Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> Go figure. But it worked really well and I was just like inspired and I just wrote. It was great. Right? I haven't listened to it since. Oh well. Right? So you have to go with what's flowing. Right? And if some piece of music is flowing for you and it's helping you be creative and it's helping you be inspired, listen to it. Right? You might get really tired of it, but at the same time it can be very helpful. Okay? Attend conferences, lectures, those kinds of things because it will make you associate with people that are interested in the same sorts of things. Okay? So there's a lecture series here. There's a poster on the door, right? Go to it. It's so worth it because you'll hear people that are really passionate and excited about whatever it is that they're going to lecture on, right? If you're invited to be a lecturer somewhere and you go do it, chances are, if you're a guest, right, you're being invited because you have a specific knowledge in a particular area and you're going to go present what you're most passionate about and what you're most excited about, right? So it's going to be a great lecture. Now, some people are better at speaking, some people are worse at speaking, sometimes that sways it. Generally, the content of the lecture is always really good, right? Be aware that there are lecture series at UC Berkeley, right? It's not very far away from here. If you want to go see some kind of big name architects come in and speak, right? When I was there, I think Tom Main came, uh, and that was a pretty big name at the time. Very interesting, right? Turned out I didn't really like him much, but it was very interesting, right? And so you can be exposed to that kind of thing, and it's worth doing that and seeking it out, okay? Inspiration is always the first step toward the final design, always. I just think this is really fun. It makes me want to read the book. Yeah. Women can't park, men can't pack. I have no idea what the book is about, but it sounds good. <laughs> right? So the design process, 
right? First thing that you need is you need to research. And this, this applies whether it's, whether it's uh, graphic design or whether it's architectural design, product design, whatever. You need to understand what's going on, right, in a particular uh, field. And we'll get into this a little bit more. Information gathering is next. Brainstorming, finally conceptualization, thinking about it. Then you experiment with different ideas. You develop those ideas, and finally you execute those ideas. You cannot skip steps in this, right? You can't jump to a final product. Design is always an evolution. You'll never get to the final product without going through the steps, right? You also can't focus on the final outcome because if you focus on that, it won't, it won't develop and you're going to have to go back and do the other steps anyway, right? Every step that you go through needs to have your full attention. You can't be distracted by other things during the design process. You really need to focus and that's the way, that's the way it works, right? It can be very exhausting. Right? You, will, you will get to a point where you'll have bags under your eyes and you'll be exhausted by going through this. And that's normal. Right? It's also thrilling, exciting, it's totally worth it. Okay? Now there are other reasons in life when you have bags under your eyes, but we'll get to those when you get older. Right? So, so it usually starts with something called the project brief. Right? This is the initiation of the design process. It's some kind of an overview, hopefully it's meticulous, of whatever the project is going to be. Let's say you're in 220 or you're in 221, right? You're going to start with some kind of, you're designing a skyscraper. It's going to have this many floors, right? This is the site. It's going to give you that kind of information, right? If you're doing the lecture series poster, it's going to be, you're doing the lecture series. Here's the lecturers. We need a poster for it, right? It's going to be some kind of a script for what is needed, okay? It's going to address the design in detail, right? And every aspect of the problem that you're trying to solve. Hopefully, okay? Sometimes these are more vague than others, okay? It's also hopefully going to define the roles of the designer. What's your job, right? The client, what's the client's job besides writing the check, okay? And the viewer, right? Remember, the client and the viewer could be the same person or they could be different people. All right, so the project brief. You're going to begin with the information that's given to you by the client, Okay? That information is always going to vary a great deal. Sometimes you'll get the most vague suggestion of, I think I want this, and no more detail. Sometimes you'll get it completely laid out in a 20-page document that says, this is what I want. Right? It's your job to clarify that information and talk to your client about what is necessary. Right? So, for example, I give you an assignment right, for the lecture series poster. Right? Technically speaking, I'm the client. I'm the one initiating this process. You're the designer. If you don't understand something that I'm asking for, it's your job to ask me and seek that clarification. Right? It's your job to ask those questions. Right? Clarify, fill in those missing pieces. Right? Define what are the primary goals. Right? What are the messages to be expressed? What's the purpose of this? Right? Then you want to define any restrictions. Right? Is there a budgetary restriction? Right, can only spend a certain amount of money. Can you afford color or black and white? Right, those kinds of things. Is there a restriction in terms of you can't show certain types of photographs because it's going to be in a preschool, right, or whatever? Right, think about that. Okay, define the timetable for completion. Right, how much time do you have to work on this project? And define who your audience is. Okay, then you're going to start gathering, and the gathering phase is critical. It's when you're going to collect all the stuff that's going to ultimately make the poster, make the book, make the portfolio. Um, you're going to gather everything that's to be used. Generally, there's going to be some stuff missing, and you're going to have to ask somebody else for it. Right? If it's missing, and you, you know, you're, you're responsible either to make it or to find somebody who's going to make it. A good example that I have is, um, this was a couple years ago, um, I had somebody who wanted to, to run for public office in an election. And they said, hey, you know a lot about websites. Can you write a website for me? And I said, sure, no problem. I got my server. I'll set it up for you. and We can do a, we can do a, uh, a website for you. In that process, it was like, okay, well, I'll set up the website. But like, you need text about who you are and you know, what your mission statement is in public office or, or any of that kind of stuff. Right? Because I, I'm not going to write it for you. 
right? So you need to kind of define that and you need to tell your client, in this case the person who is running for the election, hey, here's the information I need in order to put it on your website, right? If they don't give it to you, then it's your job to write it, which is kind of the problem, okay? Then you go into research mode, information gathering, okay? You, as a designer, get this incredibly great experience of becoming an expert in a variety of things, right? Because in order to design something for someone, you have to really understand it, right? And this is, this is part of what I love about architecture and part of what I love about studio projects is you're going to go through school and each studio you go into, they're going to give you, hey, this semester we're going to design a museum. Well, guess what? You have to become an expert in what it means to design a museum and what makes a good museum, right? Then the next class, suddenly you're going to be doing a housing project, right? And you're going to have to understand what does it mean to live in a small little tiny apartment, right? Then the next class, you're going to be given a zoo, and you're going to have to design a zoo. You know, I don't know. I'm throwing this stuff out, right? Whatever it is, it's going to vary. And each time, you have to do a bunch of research to understand what makes a zoo, a museum, right? A library, an archive, uh, a house. What makes that particular thing good, right? So you do this research. It's really fun. Right? Then you read and evaluate and understand all the provided materials. Obviously, it doesn't do you any good if you're doing a graphic design uh, project and you haven't actually read the material. You should probably read it. It's a good idea. Right? Then you want to go out and research any additional information. Right? What other competitors are out there? What are other people doing? Right? Become aware, basically. Then you want to review your client's current communication materials. Right? What are they currently using? What do their logos look like? That sort of thing. Right? So we'll get to exercise 111 in a second, but today you're going to create a new album cover for whoever your favorite artist is. Okay? So in this phase, you would do research. You'd go look at all the rest of the albums that they've ever done. You'd look at what their covers look like, and you'd see what's appropriate. Right? What would their next album be like? Okay? And then obviously you investigate competitive markets. Then we get into the brainstorming phase. Uh, and there's a variety of ways of doing this. Um, generally in the design realm, it's mostly centered around drawing some sketches, right? And kind of playing around with ideas, little pieces of a building, little pieces of a design, right? Then we get into conceptualization, right? This is when you kind of formulate the plan for the project, right? What is the link between the design, the function, and delivery, right? This is when it kind of all gels together, okay? I love this poster. I think, it's, I think it's great, right? The Kansas State Fair. Love it. Then you start to experiment, and this is where, where it gets kind of fun. As you start to work through the design process, you try different colors, you try different compositions, you change the topography, and again, this is centered around graphic design, not architectural design. Uh, you develop different treatments for the illustrations. What's, what's it going to look like? How are you going to put it together as a package, right? You vary the sequence. You change the order. Right? You keep trying different things right? until you get to something that really starts to work. And that's where you get down to the execution phase, which is distilling down the best ideas, right? getting into the details of those ideas and really understanding it, making sure that it's working. Right? And then we get to this, this one line, which might be the most important thing I say in the entire semester, and that's divorce from attachment. Okay? And this is something that is extraordinarily difficult. It's very, very hard, right? And that is that when you get to the point of really designing something, you, you, you can't help yourself but get really involved in it, right? You get really obsessive about it, you get really personal about it, and you put a lot of yourself into whatever this is, right? And it doesn't matter whether it's graphic, architectural, whatever, okay? Then you get to a critique. You get to a place where somebody's going to give you some feedback on this, right? And they may tear it to pieces, right? They may really start to go after it, and that's normal, okay? The factor in this is all too often, right, when somebody starts to really critique something heavily, right, people always take it personally because they have so much of themselves invested in whatever this is. And it's hard. I promise you this is hard. What you need to learn to do as a designer, and this is kind of, I think, what architectural school is really all about when you distill it down, is you need to find a way to take yourself out of that equation. Even though you're personally attached to it, when you get to that final review, right, you walk into that room and you view your project as if you were a member of the audience, right? Because that's the only way you can really learn from it. 
right? You have to really listen to what these people have to say. And you might think afterward that they're a bunch of idiots. But at the same time, you have to be able to listen. You can't get angry. You can't get frustrated, right? You can't pass out on the floor because you're too tired. It's your job as a designer to walk into that and really listen to what people have to say, okay? So that's, that's divorcing from attachment. You have to do it, and you have to learn. And it takes a long time to do it, okay? Trust me, trust me, right? But you'll get there, I promise, okay? Then you review, go back, review the project brief. Did you actually solve what you were trying to solve? Did you succeed in this, right? And then you produce the final draft of the project. Coupled with all of this is something called intuition. And, and I like to talk about it, but it's kind of one of the hardest things to try to explain to people um, because it's the, just the right feeling about something, right? No matter how much I can sit here and talk to you about uh, margins and gutters and flow lines and everything else technical about graphic design, there's a certain part of it that just comes down to your intuition, your gut reaction to that's right or that's wrong. And that's one, one of the things that you as a designer really have to develop for yourself, okay? Good comprehension of techniques does not equal good design, okay? If comprehension of techniques equaled good design, computers would be able to design things for us, and we wouldn't bother being designers, right? That's the weird trade-off, okay? So intuition is a different level of thinking, right? It's the complement for your rational thought, your rational process, this is what I'm doing, right? This is the compliment. It's the thing that's just floating around in your head saying, yeah, you should do this. Yeah, you should do this. Or no, that's a bad idea, right? It's that part of it, okay? It comes out naturally. It cannot be forced. You can't force it to come out. As soon as you start to force it, it becomes rational, right? It becomes part of your normal thought, right? It allows for the thoughts that would not come as part of a natural process, right? A rational thought process. Right? It's those, those things that are just going to pop into your head. Right? It's the thing that happens when you wake up in the middle of the night and suddenly have an idea. Okay? So your intuitive functions are primarily guidance, also protection. Right? So it's the thing that says, mm, I don't know, that's a bad idea, maybe you shouldn't do it. Right? That, there's, there's some protection in it. It's part of your inspiration, certainly. It's part of your enlightenment, and it's part of your final synthesis process. Right? So what, what does intuition do? It cultivates your imagination, which is critical, right? It always allows designers to move beyond their comfort zone, right? It's very, very easy as a designer to fall into, hey, this is what I do. This is what I always do. It always is relatively successful. Life is good, right? In order to be a good designer, though, you have to step outside that box. You have to lean over the edge uh, and trust that somehow you'll get there. Right? That's what the best designers do. If you look at the best architects in the world, that's what they do. Right? And you have to be willing to do that if you're going to be one of them. Right? It's going to lead to the fresh and innovative solutions. It's going to lead to the, the things that people haven't thought of yet. Right? It's generally the spark that's going to push you forward. So the challenges of intuition, however... Right? You have to allow that intuition to surface without worrying about the final outcome. Right? Sometimes intuition is pushing you in a direction that you think is really stupid, but if you let it go, it will actually push you in the right direction. Right? It takes time to believe your instincts are valuable right? and that they're, they're valid and to listen to them. So you have to work on cultivating that and listening to your instincts. You also shouldn't prejudge or, or right, flat out abandon any of these intuitive ideas without letting them kind of mature. So you shouldn't just say to yourself, oh, that's dumb, I'm not going to think about that. Right? Let, it, let it go. You never know what's going to happen. Right? It isn't always useful or appropriate, but we try to, we try to have it just in case. Okay? So how do you nurture that intuition? Don't be afraid to take risks. In this class, you will never, ever be penalized for taking a risk. Okay? If you want to try something new and it fails miserably, I have a regrade option in there. Right? There's a reason for that. You should be allowed to do that. Right? Don't be afraid to step out onto thin ice and give it a shot. That's okay. Right? Furthermore, in your studio environment, and this is, this is where it's really hard, uh, and you, you'll get to this as, as you move on in, in a studio realm, grades in architecture become less important. 
right? And certainly you have to have good grades. But you will find when you move on into the upper studios, not so much here, but let's say you go on to Berkeley or Cal Poly, you may get one grade in the middle of the semester, one grade at the end, right? In grad school, you just get a grade at the end of the semester. There's no grading, there's no points, there's no math. It's just, yeah, your work was B work, you get a B. No, you did a pretty good job, you get an A, right? That's how it works. There is no grades, right? I mean, there are grades because there have to be, but it's not... It's not formulaic in any way, okay? And so you, you have to just be willing to take these risks and not worry about the consequence, which is really hard. I know you guys are all trying to transfer, uh, or a lot of you are trying to transfer. You care about your grades and all that sort of thing. So maybe you can't take as big of risks as you would like, but certainly I'm giving you permission right now in this class, go for it, okay? And try to do it in your studio classes too, because you'll get better results out of it if you do, right? Listen to that inner voice and react to it, Right? Expect the unexpected to come out, and that's a good thing. Okay? Don't overanalyze. That's the other thing. Don't, don't micromanage. Just kind of let that intuitive flow. Let that intuition flow. And you want to record your thoughts and collect the visuals. So as you're being inspired, as you're letting that intuition flow, right, collect that, draw it, and elevate your game. Okay? In the design process, I think this sums it up better than anything else. In the design process, there are things that you think about rationally, those that you learn about, and those that you're looking for. And then there is the most interesting part that you cannot be rational about. You just feel it for some strange reason. Right? That's, the, that's the key line. You just feel it for some strange reason. It's just right, or it's just wrong. Okay? If you feel it right, it'll fit into the concept perfectly and make it more interesting and unique. Right? And this is something that you'll find in your, your studio reviews, your critiques. You'll find that a guest reviewer will come in and they'll say, you know, that's not, it's, not, it's just not working right. right. There's something off about that. You, have anybody ever experienced that? <coughs> Somebody says that? Right? That right there is that person's intuition saying, it's just not quite right. right? So it's very, very common for that to happen, right? Where we as designers have a feeling about this is good or this is bad. And you can also see the same thing happen where somebody gets really excited about a project. It might be totally, you know, this might happen to your neighbor or something. It may have happened to you, right? You're frustrated. You worked really hard on your project. You get, you get slammed in your critique. Your neighbor throws up some drawings that look like they're really shabby and they weren't well polished or anything like that. And the reviewers get totally excited and they're like, oh, well, if you did this, and if you did that, and if you, oh, what about this, and, right? It's because they had some piece of intuition there that, that just feels right, right? And they're on the right track for something. So we, as critics, come in and get all excited about it because it's on the right track, and it has that right little bit of intuition to move it forward. So you have to learn, as a student, to cultivate that in yourself and be able to trust that gut reaction, this is right, this is wrong, right? Furthermore, if you help each other with that, You'll develop your own skills, but at the same time, you'll help somebody else move forward, right? So lean to your neighbor and say, yeah, that doesn't really work, right? Or, oh, that's really working, and this is why I think it's working, right? That's part of the critical process. Okay, so we'll stop this, and we'll move, and we'll start talking InDesign. Okay, so today you have exercise 111, which is your kind of basic introduction to InDesign. I'm asking you to create an album cover of whoever your favorite artist is. And I, I must say, I find this one one of the more entertaining ones because it's really fun to see who people pick as their artists, right? Um, and so, anyway, we're going to talk through uh, InDesign um, as, as kind of a basic overview. Um, next class, we're going to deal with type and typography, uh, or you will deal with type and typography. And then on next Monday, a week from today, you're going to create a little mini um, architecture program postcard about the program here, okay? And so it's kind of a kind of get used to InDesign for the, over the next couple days. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and open up InDesign, and it, there, as far as I know, there isn't a shortcut on the desktop, so you actually have to go to Start and then All Programs, and you want to make sure that you go to Design Standard CS6 and open InDesign CS6. Now I will caution you right now. InDesign is probably the worst Adobe application at being backwards compatible. So if you create a file in Adobe InDesign CS6, 
it will not be readable by CS5, 4, 3. It doesn't go backwards, right? If you open CS, a six, CS6 file in the Creative Cloud, it may or may not be backwards compatible to CS6. So you have to be very careful with versioning. What? It's not. Okay. So therein lies the same problem. So you have to be very, very careful if you're using like your own laptop or something at home and you have the Creative Cloud instead of CS6. Be aware. Right? There are, there, there are issues. Okay? So uh, when I first open InDesign, I'm prompted with the ability to create uh, a document. And so I'm going to create a new document. Notice that there is a book option as well. We're only dealing with documents right now. So I'm going to click on document and it'll bring up the new document dialog box. Okay. So if we look here, we have document presets, right? There isn't any right now. We have intent, whether it's print web, right? Generally what we're going to be creating is for print, but if you were creating ju just something for, uh, you know, the web, you would create that. It has to do with the color space that's being used. For, for us, we're going to stick with print. Right? I have the ability to create multiple pages if I want. Um, we're only creating one page today, uh, and I'm going to uncheck the box for facing pages. That just means, do you have two pages <coughs> like this that face each other, or do you have just single side pages? Sorry, single side pages like this in your booklet. Okay. So, um, when I get to page size. Today we're going to pick compact disc because we're creating an album cover. Okay, If one of these other sizes isn't quite right, say it was letter, uh, notice that the width and height are in a weird measurement. Right, It's actually a measurement called picas, which are um, a graphic design layout. If we wanted this to be in inches, we can actually type the inch value. So let's say I wanted it to be 4 inches by 4 inches. I can type in... Uh, four inches by four inches, it looks like I said 45 inches, uh, and it will automatically translate. I'll show you how to fix those units later on, but the point is you can type it in here as well. But for today, I'm doing a compact disc, so that's fine, right? Orientation is exactly what it looks like. Is it portrait or landscape, right? And then the rest of this really doesn't matter so much. Uh, it does have margins if we wanted to put those in, um, and it has a gutter set and whatever. But the defaults are just fine. So I'll go ahead and say okay. And I'll end up with a, basically a white screen that has a black box here. And notice that there's kind of a thin <coughs> line on the top and left edge and the thicker line on the bottom and right edge, right? That's designed to mimic this is the sheet of paper that I'm working on, right? So anything inside of that black line is in the document. Anything outside of it isn't, okay? We also have kind of a pink and purple set of lines here. Those are what are called the margins of the page. They mean absolutely nothing. Okay, so they don't they don't affect anything print-wise. They're completely arbitrary, right? Right now they're set at a half inch. Makes no difference. Okay, I can change them uh, if I go to layout margins and columns. I can change them to be say zero, because like I said, they mean nothing. And I can say okay, and they go away. Right, or at least they go onto the edge of the page. Okay, so one of the fundamental things about um, InDesign, actually let me walk through uh, a bit of the, the layout here. Uh, this should look very similar to Photoshop uh, in kind of its basic setup. It's again an Adobe product, so it's not too far off. On the left hand side here we have a variety of tools that we're going to be using. Okay, A couple things that are different and kind of critical to pay attention to is instead of a foreground color and a background color, this time we have what's called a fill color and a stroke color. Basically means what is the fill of an object. Let's say I had a square. What color is it filled with? Right? The stroke color is the outline. Right? What color is the outline of the object? Okay? So it's slightly different there. Uh, the rest of the tools are relatively similar. Right? The ribbon here across the top has information about whatever um, object I'm currently working on or whatever tool I currently have selected. Okay? On the right side here, we have a variety of uh, windows that can be opened up. Uh, the page window, for example, we have layers, just like in Photoshop. right? We also have something called links. I'll explain those in just a second. But we also have options for stroke. Right? What does the line look like? We have color swatches if we wanted to use a particular color swatch. 
right? And a variety of other choices down here as well. Um, you can change the default uh, menu bar setup by checking something up here. Mine says advanced. I don't know what yours says. Uh, but depending on what you're doing, if you were typing and dealing with text, you might switch to the typography. And it gives you a different set of uh, windows over here. And if we switch to essentials, it would give us a different set. right? Um, I have no idea why mine was on advanced, but it was on advanced, so we'll leave it there. That's fine. Uh, okay. So again, um, one of the critical things to understanding in InDesign is InDesign is built as a layout tool, right? So your job here is not to create content, but to lay it out in some kind of a print format. So if I'm making a PDF of uh, my portfolio, right, I'm gonna do all the layout work in InDesign. If I'm doing a poster for my architectural project, it's gonna be done in InDesign, okay? So this is just where you assemble the pieces that you've created, okay? So the first thing that we need in creating an album cover is we need the pieces of the puzzle, okay? So uh, I'll go, you can use one of your own images. You can also search on Flickr. I just picked a, a random kind of image that looked like it would be a good album cover. Um, I don't know, somehow that, that worked for me. So um, it doesn't matter what you pick, right? I went ahead and I saved this image onto my flash drive and this is what I'm gonna use um, for my album cover, okay? So I've gone ahead and I've saved that. Now I need a way of putting it into my InDesign file. And so the way that it goes in is that I need something called a frame to put it into, okay? So over here on my left-hand side tools, you'll see that there's a rectangle with a cross in it, okay? That's called the frame tool. It's a rectangular frame. If I click on it, right, it'll give me the option to create a frame. Uh, and so if I click and drag, Right? I'll create a rectangle, and you see that it's kind of this bluish color and it has an X in the middle of it. Okay? That basically means I can put something inside this frame. It works just like a picture frame. Okay? If, if you wanted a different shape, if you click and hold on the frame tool, you'll see that there's an ellipse frame tool and there's a polygon frame tool, if you wanted one of the other frame tool options. Okay? So, once I have this frame drawn out, I'm going to do what's called a place of an object into <laughs> the image. And so I'll go to File and then Place. Notice that I do have the object selected. Okay, so it's selected. I'll make sure it's selected. There it is. I'll go to File and then Place. And I'm going to go find on my flash drive that image that I just saved. Oops. It would help if I was in the right class, right? So there's that image, and I'll go ahead and say open, and it will drop the image into the frame. Okay? So what happens when I do that is InDesign creates a preview of my image. See how it's kind of pixelated and ugly? Okay? It creates a preview of the image and sticks it on the page for me. Okay? It also preserves a link to here's the original file. And so whenever I go to export it, say to a PDF to print or whatever, or if I went to file print and tried to print it, it then says, okay, hold on a second, let me go get the original image and I'll drop the original image in place of the previewed image. And this is done for size, okay? If I have a 100 page book full of images, right, it would be a really heavy document if it had all the full size images in it, right? It'd be big, slow down the computer. So InDesign does this all with reference files. Okay. That being said, you need to keep the reference files or you'll lose them. Okay, So we need to have the originals on your flash drive. Don't just download them to the desktop, link them in, save your InDesign file, don't save the original images because then you'll have to go back and find the original images again. So you have to have the originals on your flash drive and the InDesign file. They work together. Does that make sense? Really important to understand. Okay, We can see that here if we click on the links window. Right? You can see that I have, under links, the name of my JPEG. Right? It also will tell me where it is. I can choose to relink it. Right? I can choose to update it. If I were to change, right, this, doesn't, this doesn't work so much in, in a photograph, but let's say I had an architectural drawing, let's say I had a floor plan, um, and I placed it into a final port, um, presentation document. Okay? 
and I updated the floor plan, I changed something, and I made a new export of it, resaved it, you'd be able to update the link and it would give you the new information in your InDesign file. So if you update the original, it will update the InDesign file as well. Okay? So if I don't like the jaggedness of this, I can right click on the image and there's an option for display performance and I can say high quality display, which will sharpen up the image to be an accurate representation. Okay? The other thing that happens is there's a lot more to this image than is actually showing right now. Okay, if we, if we jump back to my uh, image file, you see how there's a bunch more over here that's not showing up in, in my final image? Okay, I can choose right, to move this independent of the frame. So if I double click on the image, see how I get this kind of tannish color? That's the overall size of my image. And so I could choose to move this to a different place right inside of this image. The other thing that I can do is I can right click on the image oops I have to select it. I can right click on it and I go to a menu option called fitting and this is where I have a variety of, of choices. I can fit the frame to the content which basically makes the frame bigger to fit the content. I can fit the content to the frame okay what that'll do is it'll squish right it squishes the image down okay which may or may not be a good thing. I can go to fitting again, and I can say center the content so it's centered, right? I can also say fill frame proportionally. So keep the same proportions of the image, but make sure I fill everything, right? So looks basically like it did. Or I can go to fit content propor proportionally, which means show me the whole picture, but part of it's going to get clipped. Right, so the top and the bottom right, aren't, aren't completely full. Right? The other thing that I can do is I can adjust the size of the frame by dragging on the corners, right? and it makes my frame bigger. Notice that it doesn't change the size of the image at all. It just shows more or less of the image. Okay? That's different than scaling. We'll get to scaling in a second. Right, so here I still have a little bit that's cut off, so I might need to double click, right? Make that a little bit. Oh, looks like the bottom, so it's not quite big enough. Let me right click. Hold on a second. Right click, fitting, and we're going to fill frame proportionally. There we go. And then we'll drag it over a little bit. Something like that. Okay. So. I still have this black bar at the bottom that I'm not really happy with. I'd like that to go away. So I'm going to use my little scale tool right here when I have the background image selected. So when I have this tan image selected, I'll use the transform tool which is right here. And we'll make this a little bit bigger. I'm going to hold down shift while I do it to make sure it stays in proportion. And we'll make that a little bit bigger. This way you can kind of see what the image looks like behind the frame. Okay. So one of the hardest things to conceptualize in early InDesign use is that the frame is independent of the image. They're two objects, right? And they're working together to create this overall image, okay? So let me press Control-0 so I can see everything. Good. Uh, and then it's time for a little bit of text, right? So I'll click on the, the text tool. It works just like you would think it would, right? Where I can drag and create a text box, right? Up here, I have options for text. So let me go ahead in this ribbon, I'm going to pick centered so it's in the center. right? And then I'll go ahead and type something. Okay. I can control the size, right? just like a font size. So we can go up in size, something like that. I can also change the font to be whatever font um, looks appropriate. Right? That might be a little bit big now, so we'll jump it down. Something like that. Now, it's black right now, and I may want it to be white. If that's the case, I'll double click, select it, and I'm going to come over here to my fill color, and I'll double click that and change the color to be white. Hit OK. And now it's white, right? which of course you guys can't see anymore, <laughs> but if I moved it down here, you'd be able to see it. OK? So, the other option that I have is I can create an outline around it. So I can come here to my outline or my stroke color, and we could double click and we can make that black. 
And now I have a little black outline. And if I move it to the top, you can see that I have that black outline. Okay. I can I can make that go away if I don't like it by clicking on the outline, and then from this where this little black square is, I can pick a apply none, which basically puts a red slash through it and makes it go away. Okay. So what I'm looking for today is for you to have placed an image, right? To put some text in, right? Maybe change the colors a little bit, change the size, right? Then when it's time to export your work, right? You'll go to File, Export, and you're going to pick a JPEG, and I'm going to save it to my flash drive. And we'll call this album one or whatever. And I'll go ahead and click save. And under these options, a couple things that are important. The resolution should be set to 300. The quality should be set to at least high, if not maximum. Okay. And then I'll go ahead and click on export. And it'll then create a JPEG of this. Now, I need to save that JPEG, but I also need to save the InDesign file. So I'll go up to File, Save, and I'll save this to that same location. And I'll click Save. All right, having the InDesign file lets me go back and edit the the the, um, the layout right independently of the JPEG that I created. Okay, so after you're done with that, you're going to post it, um, and that's all that you need to do for today. Are there any questions? No. Okay.